Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Drawing School's uh, series of con creative conversations. Uh, this evening, we're um, delighted to welcome the curator, Venetia Porter, in conversation with artists Timo Nazari and Walid Siti. This conversation was uh, prompted by the forthcoming exhibition, which Venetia has curated at the British Museum, titled Reflections, Contemporary Art of the Middle East and North Africa and which comprises over 100 works on paper from the museum's collection, and in which Timo and Walid's work is included. For both artists, drawing is at the heart of their practice, and this talk is going to explore their work and inspirations and the ways in which they've responded uh, to the pandemic. So uh, to introduce them in a little, a little more detail, Timo's, uh, Timo was born in Berlin, where he uh, lives and works. He received his diploma in photography in 1997, and his work uses the means of natural science to open up a perspective for the poetic and fantastic, as he describes it, taking inspiration from mathematics, geometry, and patterns, and underlining their interconne interconnectedness in terms of repetition and aesthetics in his drawings and sculptures. He describes his practice as one that tackles the subject of infinity and it aims to solve puzzles, whether they are historical mysteries or explorations by mathematical theorems, to discover an overarching order in the chaos of existence. Over the last few years, um, he's had several solo exhibitions in the Netherlands, UAE and Vienna, and his work has also been recently shown at the Haus Constructive um, in Zurich, the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And in 2011, he was the winner of the Rebraj Capital Art Prize. So moving on to Walid Siti. He was born in Kurdistan, Iraq and graduated from the Institute of Fine Arts in Baghdad in 1976. After which he left Iraq to continue his arts education in Slovenia before seeking political asylum in the UK in 1984. Um, and he now uh, lives and works in London. His work traverses a complex terrain of memory and loss in a world which for him has been a place of constant change. The narrative of his experience of a life lived far from, but still deeply emotionally connected to the place of one's birth is one he shares with many exiles. He's exhibited his work internationally, including at the Martis Gropius Bau in Berlin, the Imperial War Museum, in London and the Venice Biennale. And his work is also in many public collections, including the Met in, uh, in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Krakow, and um, uh, the Bajil Art, Art Foundation um, in the UAE. And both Walid's and Timo's work is collected in the British Museum. So um, it's really wonderful that they'll be in conversation with Venetia Porter, who's been really fundamental and pioneering in forming uh, the museum's collection of contemporary uh, Middle Eastern art um, as senior curator for Islamic and contemporary Middle East art. And she is also honorary research fellow at the Courtauld. Venetia was the curator for Hajj, Journey to the Heart of Islam in 2012, and lead curator for the Albuquerque Foundation Gallery of the Islamic World. Her research and pu publications range from Yemeni history through Arabic inscriptions and amulets to contemporary art. Her recent publications include editing her mother's autobiography, Thea Porter's scrapbook, and a book with the British Museum Press in connection with her um, forthcoming exhibition, Reflections, Contemporary Art of the Middle East and North Afri Africa. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be to be here. Thank you, Royal Drawing School. Thank you, Claudia, Kat, and Fraser for making this so, such an enjoyable um, experience for for us. Um, it's and to you, the audience out there, we wish that we could all see each other. But it's just lovely to know that you're all out there. And to you, Timo, and to you, Walid, it's an absolute pleasure to be doing this with you. We've known each other for a long time, and I'm a huge admirer of, of your work, both of you. 
and so proud to have some examples of your lovely work in the collection of the British Museum. But what I didn't know was that you two had not actually met each other before. So that's very nice too. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to have this conversation. Yeah. So the, the format um, of our evening is that we'll begin with a short conversation between us. And then Timo and Walid will each talk about the work they make through a series of images. We'll then come together again and talk some more. And then it's over, you, over to you, the audience, to ask some questions which uh, Claudia will moderate. And, um, and so we're, we're going to have the questions for everybody, for, for, for both artists um, at the end. So Timo and Walid, um, I want to ask you both, how have you been managing during this pandemic, during the, the, the past year? I mean, as, as artists, you're used to working alone, but this is obviously a very, very different situation. So how, how has it affected you all? Timo, do you want to start? Sure, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the Royal Drawing School and thanks to you, Venetia. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a roller coaster, like for everybody. Um, so as an artist, we're kind of used to work alone. And to a certain degree, it is very nice to have no obligations and not to have like a tight schedule to finish works. Um, but as I said, it's like a roller coaster. So there are always these moments when you think like things are never going to be OK again. And these are the moments when you're also asking yourself, what it is, what is it what I'm really working um, and what is it? Why do I go to the studio every day? What is driving me? And um, and then you realize that, at least in my case, the studio is the place where I want to be, no matter if everything is closed or not. But um, but the work is what's keeping me alive. So um, yeah, it's it's a little it's a little pause uh, in the in the life of an artist who's kind of also based in the in the art world. But um, at the same time. Uh, it is good because you you question yourself about the very basic things. Yeah, thank you. And what about you, Walid? Thank you, Venisha. I mean, first uh, to thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm so happy to be part of this uh, evening uh, talk. Uh, for me, the um, pandemic as well, like everybody else, have have some impact on them. But really, uh, at the same time, I was very kind of uh, from very early days. I took a different approach to to this as much as. I'm allowed, I mean, to be, you know, cautious, but at the same time, not to stop operating as much as I, I, I could. So every weekend since uh, last March, I've been going to studio because I could go with the car. So I can park my car there. Plus I am lucky I have a space in, my, uh, in our house, uh, the attics uh, that I, I, I continue doing there. Plus I did a few things in the garden. Um, and the, on top of all this, I'm lucky to have an assistant where we started the project of digitalizing my huge archive of paperwork and digital work on my computer, which is very messy. So it's been really quite okay for me, but not as good as I wish because as any others like Timo and um, all the, our colleagues have lost the opportunity to, you know, to exhibit, to, for a studio visit to promote ourselves as well, to get some uh, money, I mean, for our works. So, so, but um, we can't complain uh, and I can't complain because I've been able to still practice and uh, enjoy what I, I can do really. So it's been okay, really. Well, that's, yeah. good. that's good to know. That's good to know from both of you. Um, I want to just turn to the subject of drawing. So we are at the Royal Drawing School and I wanted to ask you both, did you, did you both draw a lot as children and and can you each pinpoint the moment when you knew you wanted to be an artist i'm sure you've been asked this many times but 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 first of all did you have little sketches sketchbooks and that sort of thing when you when when you were a child um timo do you want to go first um actually no i, I um I, I didn't do much drawing when I was a child, unfortunately. I, I never thought of myself as that I might end up doing drawings as my, as my main practice. It came actually much, much later. I, I'll show you later how it all started um, in the presentation. But um, um, no, that actually came by accident. And 
it's a bit the same with my career as an as an artist because there were moments during my education as a photographer where I thought are the artist the artistic direction is actually what I'm looking for because I want to have a bit more meaning in my works than than just um, taking photos of something. Um, but then I, I wasn't sure for quite a long time um, what to do. And I worked as a commercial photographer for some years, two or three years, until I realized I, I'm, I'm getting very, very unhappy here. And um, I would miss probably the opportunity of my life if I wouldn't even try and be an artist. And for some reason, that moment, everything fell into place. And um, and I, I realized that this was the, the right decision. And um, and I was lucky enough to to been able to have an artistic career. And um, and since then, uh, there wasn't the slightest doubt at any moment. Oh, and this wow. is like 20, 20 some years ago. Yeah, it is that 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 moment that everything clicks is a, is a very interesting one, isn't it? What what about for you, Walid, when you were a child yeah. and growing up in Dohuk? Were you yes, did, I mean, did you uh, grow a lot? I mean, actually, I mean, it started from primary school. Um, uh, I was fascinated by the drawing in our reading books, the colored uh, books. I think they were kind of imitating some books from England. I think so. They were very beautifully designed and very appealing. And that was always uh, attracted me. And I tried to copy them. And as well, uh, later, maybe year five, six, I start to as well um, develop idea. I mean, I don't know, I mean, notion of, of or, or hobby of uh, doing calligraphy. So I was into Arabic calligraphy, writing things for school and taking part in a school competition between school every uh, year towards the end of the year. So though the Iraq was very poor that time, but the, but the, the, the structure of, of um, you know, uh, you know, helping and supporting art and art activity in every primary school was was amazing. Um, uh, and every school used to have a, a workshop, art workshop. And that uh, continued in middle school as well. And when my teacher was very kind of um, supportive towards me, and he was suggested to me that I should go to Baghdad to study uh, well, from very young age, about 16, 17, uh, as uh, I think I remember. And, and at that time, there was only art school for that age in Iraq. But nowadays, every town have uh, their own art school, and it's so different. So it started quite early for me, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that going to Baghdad, that was the turning point for me to a path that I never returned from, <laughs> be continuing, yeah. Yeah, no, that's so interesting too. So I've just got one last quick, quick question for, for both of you. Um, I'm very struck how in in many ways your own stories, your your the the countries to which you're connected, so Iran as well as Germany for, for you, Timo, Iraq for you, um, well you continue to have an impact on your work in one way or another. And I think we're going to be seeing some some of this. But is that would it be fair to say that? Or 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 does that put you into a kind of regional pigeonhole so you know kind of putting you into this this kind of bubble of a Middle Eastern artist by by me asking you that 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 question well as you're there do you want to go first okay yes I think I, um of course it, it comes to everybody's um artists coming from that region and especially who are being inspired by that heritage or culture whatever or politics and for me of course very strong uh, is now and always been but I think I, I come to conclusion that I don't much give um, attention or um, uh, concern about that. Whatever anybody like to um, you know name me or title me or give me whatever you know categorization, I'm happy with it. I don't mind as long as I have given a freedom and an opportunity to continue work and as up to people how they uh, relate to this work and how they understand it. And for me, that's most important. And I, I think I don't care much about this thing. If the, whatever name I've been called or <laughs> given, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Well, that's very- but, no, no, no issue for me. Well, that's very tolerant of you. What about, what about you, um, Timo? Um, yeah, it is interesting because um, from the very beginning of my artistic career, I was firstly labeled as suddenly the Iranian German artist. Um, I was born in Germany to an Iranian father. Um, and I was very surprised when I when I read that in the first um, in the first bio for my first exhibition in Berlin because I never labeled myself as an Iranian German even though I am 
but um, I don't even speak Farsi. So, so for me, um, there is a big part in me who, which I discovered actually later um, by, by, by interest because I, I came across things that, uh, that were around me all the time because of my half Iranian um, heritage. But, but the labeling was very confusing uh, at the very beginning, even though I realized a lot of my works really deal with these two worlds and are actually fed by that I come from both worlds. Um, to put it simple, like having a very um, German analytical approach to very um, uh, Iranian subjects. Let, let, so to put it simple, but um, at the same time, uh, I was benefiting from that. I, I have to say that straight away because um, when you're labeled like that, you're kind of exotic for the people for some reason, which I don't really get. And in the be at one point in the beginning, my, my work were a bit more political as well. And that then came together very much. But at the same time, it was stressing me out massively at one point because I felt like having to do these obvious political works um, meant to me, I always have to react on what is happening in the world this moment, which, uh, which I didn't like at one point. I decided that I, I wanted to go more into a timeless approach to, to the works I'm, I'm interested in. Um, and still I am benefiting from, from that, but I am part of both worlds. I cannot really say I'm, no, I'm only German or I cannot say I'm, I'm only Iranian. It doesn't make sense. Um, but it's interesting because the people obviously need these labels um, to make it easier for them to, to put you in one draw. But at the same time, it is, um, I'm, I'm benefiting. I, I have to admit that. Yeah. Well, let's hope at some point we're not going to need these labels any anymore. But hopefully. Um, yeah. hopefully. Um, okay, so let's start with your presentations, both of you. Timo, okay. show us. Show us. Uh, let's, uh, wait. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, okay. I I wanted to tell you a bit about my approach to drawing and and how it is connected to my sculpture work as well. Uh, so I'll show you two ongoing projects that I've been working on for some years. It was one particular project that brought me to drawing, um, as I mentioned before, because I started my artistic career as a photographer. So I grew up in Berlin to this Iranian father in a very Iranian household. So lots of carpets, miniature paintings, books, images on Islamic art and architecture. And there was always, um, there were always images of this one particular Islamic architectural element that caught my attention even as a child. So it's called Mukarnas. So it's an ornamented vaulting um, to put it very simple. Um, but when I stood in front of one of them for the first time, um, after only seeing them in books, like 20, 25 years ago, I, I felt totally puzzled and thought, I have to understand how that works. It was like a big mystery to me. And I wanted to understand how it is constructed. And uh, to do that, I decided there's, there's only one way for me. Uh, and that is that I have to build one of those myself, which is not too easy. So. Uh, so I did the research and um, I found out about the geometry behind it and how everything is connected on a mathematical level. And I realized that, that this element, the Mokarnas, can be projected to a plane. And then the base of the structure is a combination of um, only four basic triangle shapes that can be combined in an infinite number of ways and do all these different patterns. So knowing that, um, I was able to create my own pattern. So this is the very first drawing I did on this as a preparation for a sculpture and later translated this into the third dimension as a sculpture. Um, so this is like a step in between and uh, it ended up as a sculpture in the wall with uh, its deepest point in the center uh, of the sculpture which is about one meter into the wall. Um, so drawing became a tool for understanding these structures, but, uh, 
but more than this, because in the attempt to understand the structure, I realized that the drawings began to have a life on their own. And I started using white ink uh, and did the drawings on black paper, only using a, a ruler and a compass. And I started this series of drawing, one of those is uh, in the collection of the British Museum. And but th they are at the same time using these four different shapes I showed you before, these triangle shapes, and only this. Um, but suddenly, like a universe of infinite possibilities like appeared. So, so this is an ongoing series of drawings that I'm doing for more than 10 years now. And every time a slight shift in the combination of triangles um, leads me to a different result. And by, by adding the formulas and the circles of the construction, unintentionally in the beginning, I, I added the new aesthetic layer. So the whole idea for me originally was to understand what is going on. This is why I was taking the notes and did the construction, but it ended up as something different and um, took a lot of time. And it's, it's an ongoing series. So I, I probably will continue with this infinity thing until the very end. Um, but coming back to drawing. So for me, putting something on paper is often the beginning of a process to, to understand and, and also to communicate, like to learn and communicate about something and an idea and a principle or an abstract thought. Uh, in the case, um, uh, in this case, to, to sketch or to lay out um, and to draw is, and circling in, an idea to get to understand the core of a, of a thing. So what made this pro, uh, yeah, this is, this is actually how, how these came to life and how I think about them. But there was also one other aspect um, that was very interesting to me um, uh, because on a, on a different level, growing up in Western Europe, uh, our seeing is, is mainly influenced by, by the Renaissance and the invention of the perspective view in art. So we often forget that, but, but in fact, you can call this still kind of the main difference of the art worlds from the Middle East and, and the Western one. So the perspective view made the viewer very important, um, where the idea in the Middle East is that um, man created image or patterns or ornament um, are only fragments of, of an infinite, uh, Baha'i means, um, not a representation of the real world. So um, I decided to build a space, um, like an installation, um, based on one of those black drawings where these two worlds somehow could meet. And what I did, um, I did a room where, where the viewer will, will try to put himself into perspective but will automatically get lost in this infinite reflection of mirrors arranged based on this traditional design. Uh, so what you see here is, um, is, a, is a room six by six meters, all four walls covered in about 4,500 mirrors. Um, and each is mounted to the wall with a very slight tilt so that the reflection um, is not even, but it's a scattered one, uh, where it becomes impossible to look at yourself um, as a whole or to put yourself into perspective. So the viewer gets lost in a, in a geometrical infinity. Um, and yeah, infinity again is actually uh, the other concept I wanted to talk about in the other series. Um, it plays a, infinity plays a, plays a key role in my, in my body of work. So um, for me, mathematics um, and drawing as you see, go hand in hand, not only in geometry, but also in the mathematical language, signs and, and numbers and formulas and, and everything that belongs to the mathematical language. So this series started um, after I've been working on the mathematical drawings I just showed you for a while. Um, I was in a state where the, well, the whole mathematic part of it was very tiring. And my head got spinning over formulas and I, and, I, and I was kind of sick of it. So, and I started, but this is when it happened that I started to question the whole system of, of mathematics and, and the language itself. And um, I came across the story of Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer. 
and the story is called um, The Library of Babel. Uh, it is basically, uh, you can think of it as a metaphor to visualize the infinite, but also um, at the same time, it addresses the problem of legibility. Um, people did actually even drawings to that. So this is not my drawing. Um, so to give you a short overview. So the story uh, of Borges, um, it tells, he tells the story of the universe, how he calls it, in form of a, of a vast library uh, containing all possible 400 page books of a certain format and character set. So uh, the books in this library, uh, in the story, contain every possible ordering of just 25 characters, like basic characters, like letters, on these 400 pages, um, which makes it an infinite library. Because every possible ordering of the letters at the same time um, leads to the problem that the vast majority of these books are pure gibberish. So when you open it, you just see a combination of, of these letters. But due to the fact that the library contains every possible book, um, it means that you would find every book ever written or that might ever been written as well in every language. Um, so this is a bit hard um, to imagine and to visualize uh, all possible books, but um, okay. There would be a book that tells the story of your life, um, of your neighbor's life. There would be a story with all the Shakespeare sonnets, a book with um, the timetable of every train running in Great Britain in 1949, um, a book that explains gravity on Mars, um, and a book that explains all the other books, and um, also books which only have constantly one letter, the letter A through the whole book, the letter B through the whole book, every book, literally everything. Okay, so one other idea that he touches there, so when you think of all possible books, is that, um, that words can seem senseless, uh, which happens in this library quite often. Uh, but they could have a meaning, but you need the key to understand them. Like you need a, to speak a different language to understand the words if you read them. So every possible combination of letters that looks gibberish to you, might have a meaning in another, in another language or another system of, 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 of writing or speaking. So I thought, why not inventing my own language, uh, a language system based on geometry, telling abstract stories that maybe cannot be put into words, but that create like a world on its own, like a, a world that we are lacking words to describe. Let's put it like this. So, I started drawing, telling stories using geometry. So basically these are fantasies in a, in a geometrical gibberish that someone might understand um, one day or not. Uh, maybe it's the explanation for everything uh, and we are not able to, to read it yet. Um, so this has become an ongoing series of more than 100, 120 of those draw drawings in, in different formats. Um, which will then become my, my own infinite library. And after a while I thought, why not use the same principle on these drawings that I used for the Mukarnas, these architectural elements with the blueprint drawings, um, which means translating these drawings into the third dimension so that they become sculptures or at least parts of these um, drawings become sculptures. So, this is the beginning of that. So what you hear are sculptures that originate in these geometrical fantasies that I was putting on paper first. And um, what I did is I, I took my drawings apart in, in smaller units and tried to imagine um, what these elements in there would be as sculptures. Um, so this is why they remind you on geometrical models or architectural marquettes, but the origin um, in my drawing is uh, the origin of my of these uh, sculptures are my my geometrical fantasies only, uh, which then lead to very different results that you wouldn't 
necessarily directly connect back to the drawings, but you see that there's a certain familiarity. And um, yeah, basically this is it. Uh, this is my last publication, which tells a totally different story that I have to tell another time, but um, I think so. My, my time <laughs> is up and uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm handing over to you, Walid, if you want to continue. Thank, Thank you, you Timo, wonderful. Get out. Great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Still right. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Now, my story with the drawings. Um, as I was mentioned before to Venetia, that um, I started with the drawing very early ages uh, in my primary school. Went to Baghdad out of school for five years, and there was quite a lot of focus on drawing um, in, inside the school and uh, outside as well. Uh, each student used to have a, a portfolio with a lot of paper, like a newspaper. Uh, Type of paper was very cheap and pencil. You go to the cafe, or restaurant, at, at, and the school residents, I mean, house residents, and you would draw every day, you would draw. So there was quite a, a lot of, um, uh, you know, attention given to, to drawing. Then when I joined the um, uh, uh, art course in Ljubljana, Slovenia, I mean, ex Yugoslavia, in uh, 1976, uh, again, there was so much emphasis on live drawings. Uh, models, uh, you know, anatomy, perspective, everything. So this uh, really helped me a lot later as an instrument to be able to continue doing my art or practice my art. So drawings have really been with me all this time uh, as a companion. So when I came to London 84 as, as a refugee, uh, it was very difficult for me to have a space, of course, or have a money or means to buy material. So this uh, experience with drawing came very handy. All I needed was to buy some um, ink and pencils, crayon and charcoal. The rest is, was just uh, uh, using um, cheap paper uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, like this one. Oh, sorry, this one. Oh. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, back the envelopes, uh, bank um, letters, um, or uh, you know, piece of newspapers or magazines, just do anything on them. And that, um, you know, uh, allowed me to continue practice my, my work without, uh, you know, uh, uh, without, you know, feeling that I'm, I, I mean, uh, difficult for me to, to, to to have access to a space or canvas or a larger work a paper or something like that. So I'd be able to, to continue. And that really helped me. And, and meanwhile, um, at the same time, uh, there was uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for me to, to the, that London, uh, the, the opportunity it gave me to find myself as an artist, my voice as an artist. At the same time as well, artist, uh, where I belong and what, what uh, I'm ready to, what I want to express and, and so on. At that time back in Iraq, when uh, of course I still feel very much strong um, uh, ties to it, emotionally and uh, of course uh, my family is there. Uh, so th there were many war raging back and the oppression against the Kurds and uh, um, um, all the people who raised their voice against the regime, they were persecuted. So uh, the, 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 the practice of drawing become as a tool, uh, as an instrument to express this idea, to relate to this kind of traumas, memories and, and uh, suffering uh, happening back in, in Iraq. So for a while, uh, my work uh, continued as such in like this work, sorry, you know, sorry, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, and this uh, work, which is a um, uh, crayon, I saw charcoal on paper, a serious work which I, I, I was engaged with for many years, as, as I was saying before, the, uh, the Iraq Iran war was going on for eight years, plus the um, in, internal violence going in, in, inside Iraq due to the regime's policy. So I was engaged in this kind of uh, work, which is very immediate, very free, and um, fluent uh, 
So I did uh, uh, as well some etching. I, I joined some um, etching workshops in London and block printing. Um, uh, that uh, was allowed me to continue to do my work. And I had the first opportunity to exhibit my work, but all that was to do again with uh, work on paper and etching in Kofa Gallery that time in 87 with uh, two Iraqi artists of mine who studied with me in Slovenia at the same time. So uh, thus the drawing was very kind of um, the, the mean and, and, and the, the instrument that uh, I managed to, uh, to be able to practice my art um, um, continuously until now. So, uh, so it was very difficult to talk about all aspects and all uh, say stage of my work, but uh, uh, in this kind of short talk, uh, because I'm, I, I have um, made a selection of images of uh, different um, work that represent different stages of my work, a medium I use uh, during all about 40 years of my life in London, since 84 is less a bit, but 37 years of uh, my life in London. Um, uh, so here, um, after the, the war series, I was engaged emotionally. I start to, to feel that I need to do something different. I, I was uh, too much uh, uh, emotionally, I would say, consumed and not able to do something but uh, much because I feel a sense of helplessness in that. So I start to, to research on some element of architecture and, and uh, of our culture and uh, of, of Islamic and Mesopotamian um, culture that I start to you know, say um, employ them in my artwork in this, uh, like in these sketches you see here. So this is the minaret of Samarra or the uh, ziggurat and, and as well a uh, different element, a political element like the, the flags and uh, like a, the, the, we call it um, uh, barren landscape uh, where it's like a, a platform or a theater of where many things is uh, uh, happening um, uh, around. Yeah, so again here that uh, drawing again, um, uh, inspired by the ziggurat and mountains and uh, minaret of Samarra, that I, it become a very important uh, element or component of my uh, art practice, uh, where where it ended up in a series of uh, of uh, sorry of uh, uh, work. Um, one of them is called um, Parasha Stone where I focused on um, um, different symbolism of stones, of uh, stone like stone of Kaaba or the Minaret of Samarra, or the stone as a very important, um, important component of the uh, Kurdish uh, geography, where uh, is a part of mountain where the Kurds feel that uh, the place of refuge and the last friend they have. So these uh, symbols, this element became very important part of the composition of my drawing in different series, as I said here. And then uh, in, in other one, uh, Family Ties uh, series, where again, uh, everything somehow uh, connect to the, to the center where uh, the, the, this kind of interest relation between uh, the, the center as a symbols of, of uh, head of family or, or, or head of tribe or head of government or whatever. And this, this uh, organic um, matters of, of of, of bodies or of, of entities evolving around the center where they tie in very kind of intricate relation where there's some, uh, um, you know, uh, comfortability of security of connected to the center, but at the same time it's kind of uh, this kind of um, a limitation to your movement due to this tight um, um, uh, formation. Again, here, this again, uh, family ties, uh, I, um, again, the same, the, uh, using the, the black uh, cubic uh, um, form in the middle where, where many other cubic or semi-cubic things are, I mean, forms are evolving and uh, forming, forming this uh, uh, composition. Uh, so, as I said, and then here the mountain again, and uh, again, the same thing, the drawing is very um, important. And I, I would say that um, uh, the, the, uh, many of my series of drawings have, have become an, an art form on, on their own without being um, like uh, made to a big painting or sculpture. Only later in my work that I start to, uh, to uh, 
experiment with the 3D works and uh, uh, site specific work. Like this work, for example, um, uh, made of the many ladders as very important or very ancient uh, tool of climbing that is very as well important in the geography of Kurdish uh, villages, uh, climbing to the top of the house or a tree or to cross a river. Sorry, I, uh, I'm, I'm going back, sorry. Not, Yeah, and here uh, then um, uh, the, the 3D app started in, in 2014, 15, and, uh, and and now continuing with this uh, type of work, uh, where again the drawing has been very essential part uh, in understanding this form and uh, these architectural symbols of uh, my heritage where I come from. And the latest series uh, which I've been engaged in 16 and, and in continuous this. Uh, uh, the, the series of drawing I did on um, the tower, and uh, as you see, is mainly the tower of uh, uh, Babel, or uh, but more is the minaret of Samarra, which I think uh, somehow they are connected um, uh, in, in in formation in the structure, and uh, so this. Um, the drawing in this case, uh, like aid, aid me, help me to understand the, the form, understand how this um, uh, thing is built and being constructed. And uh, through that as well, uh, I am able to find my way to how to do, to construct uh, uh, images in 3D, 3D, I mean, work in 3D. And, and uh, to talk about this as well, work as well from 2002, uh, yeah, which uh, with a mistake here, uh, yeah, this is the number 2009, sorry. Again, it's uh, uh, like a work on paper, I would call it, but again, it's like a sort of drawing that is, um, uh, again, uh, the, the kind of, uh, the form of uh, Ziggurat uh, in the kind of this um, disturbed landscape, which uh, uh, again referred to the, uh, the, 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 what been, the violence and the war being going on in, back in Iraq, which, uh, you know, it became very important part, as I said, of all my work until now, this kind of relation to, uh, to what's going on back uh, there in Iraq. And uh, here, the, the, the book which I've um, been uh, published uh, last June, unfortunately due to the corona, one of the issues we were talking about before, that I've been lucky that I uh, had no chance to um, uh, have a, a, a book launch, but I'm very happy that uh, it came out uh, despite all these uh, challenges. And I'm very proud that uh, Venetia had a beautiful piece of written about my experience and uh, uh, my art, which because we have been associated with each other, working to, I mean, on many projects, plus that she invited with this and, and um, uh, uh, having my work in the, the the, the collection she have started back, I think, in the 80s. So I'm very happy for, for that. And I'm looking forward today that will allow me to have a proper launch of this book and uh, we share all on the, 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 uh, the content and uh, the beautiful design made of, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Walid. I think we, you can stop sharing your screen now, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I was very proud that you you invited me to write an essay in the in the book, and and I know we had such a lovely time actually just talking about your experiences and and all that. That was wonderful, and and um and it's so interesting to see the consistency in your in in your work. So these 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 icons. The you know the ziggurat the malwia but they're going a little bit like like Timo I'm quite struck actually that you know you've had a similar sort of trajectory in a way from drawing into into sculpture and T Timo I, when I went to I was lucky enough to be in Sharjah when your um, when that exhibition was on and I went into that room and I I, I have to say it was one of the most mesmerizing. Um, experiences ever and I, I I don't know whether actually that room is still there where 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 did it go is it still in the collection no it's it's in Berlin it's in my storage it's it in your storage. taken apart all the oh. 4,000 mirrors um, folded really? into piece of pieces of paper and uh, yeah waiting for the next opportunity oh to my set goodness. them up somewhere well I hope there, there will be um Timo do you have any questions for for Walid 
it, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I I, um, I I've seen only some images of of your work, Walid, and uh, it is interesting how one's brain is trained by what you're used to see. So when I look at when I first had a look at your art, I um, I had very different. I made very different connections um, because one of the first thing was the Tower of of Babel that came to my mind. Uh, but obviously, what 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 you were referring to is more like the ancient um, history of Iraqi monuments. And then also, um, I, I thought you were kind of working on on Tatlin, uh, on the revolutionary tower of, of of Tatlin from, I think, exactly 100 years ago. Um, and this is why I was always questioning myself: is like, are you, are you, th how do you think of these? towers that you build is it more like an utopian idea or more a dystopian idea because it, it somehow it feels that there's certain danger in them as well um, but at the same time they can be seen as 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 a man-made monument to to get closer to um or to to get up from the earth um so i i wasn't really sure if you think of them more in a dystopian or more a utopian way or if that can be said at all that's, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, uh, thank you for this uh, interesting question. No, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of that uh, in a utopian sense. I mean, the, the, the tower, uh, I mean, uh, the main inspiration for, uh, of tower is really the Malouia, which I have visited last year. Uh, I mean, 2019, October, and I'm, I'm trying to make some video about it. I'm still in the process. I'm getting new footages again from Samara because I couldn't go due to um, COVID. But Samara has been uh, really in my um, yeah, in my mind in, in my 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 uh, art uh, for a long time because I was passing by when I was a student uh, passing from the home my town in the north going to Baghdad every every two weeks, but I never managed to to climb it. So the last the time I went, I even I climb it and I video it and it's amazing and uh, overwhelming um, uh, you know monument. Uh, of, of aesthetic beauty and uh, uh, universal, as you say, timelessness. Uh, you talk about timeless, and as well, this is as well uh, an icon, an universal icon of timelessness, uh, of beauty. That it, um, it's in, in, in international its appeal and, and it's cross borders. So I thought uh, this is uh, not just Islamic, it is really universal in every sense um, uh, for its aesthetic and, and it's so many layers of meanings because as you were talking about it, uh, utopian and dystopian, but the, the utopian in that one and, and many other, uh, you know, towers, which I as well try to, you know, uh, you know, use in my, my work is this kind of idea of, of climbing up uh, and, and, and this is a cycle of, of life and the thrive of person, of hum, human to, to go up. And each time you go from, you start from very a big circle and you slowly end up in a very tiny circle, which you have no option only to come back again. And that's, um, it, it really kind of, um, it, 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 I would say it, it, it entail the, the story of humanity, of everybody's path. Uh, and, and in that as well, but in that um, path, in that journey, you've enlightened you, you, you achieve a, a higher social position or power. It depends what is the, uh, what, uh, how, uh, who are the person who, who, who are is the seeker of this uh, point of high point. But it could be many, many uh, ideas as well. It could be political and, and, and enlightened as well. Person, when you go up there and you have a, the horizon in front of you, you see yourself in relation to, to the to the surrounding and as as in your work and the cosmic if I use that word from you uh, yeah to do to, to the everything together I mean in as a one whole piece so for me that's what uh, it came to me the idea of uh, these towers yeah nice great yeah, yeah. we share an interest in towers absolutely yes yeah, yeah. Yes. absolutely so T Timo you took you talked about the poetic and the fantastic. Yeah. What, did you, what, did you, what did you mean about? Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, maybe this is a bit of a of a reaction to the time we live in as well. Um, uh, it is uh, often I uh, people people ask me um, how true are the to are the stories that I'm telling about my work, um, and then you realize. I mean, first of all, uh, truth in different cultures. Uh, comes from 
has very, not different meanings, but they are very different approaches to it. And truth in art um, is a subject that is, is, a, is a very Western idea. Um, so, because this is the field of fantasy and of total freedom so that you, you could be able to, to live and, and create fantasies that are not only inspiring for you, but that, that, that take you to a certain kind of different, different level. So I'm not really looking for truth. And this is why fantasy is a great vehicle um, to free my mind in, in, in this sense and, and to get to different thoughts and to have ideas that are out of the, of, of, they are off the normal track maybe in a good way. And I think um, I'm always, I'm always looking for this inspiration in something that goes beyond reality, maybe all the, the, the everyday reality. I think there's a, there's a big benefit um, uh, that we can some, sometimes leave this, this place of, of being in the realistic world. And, and, and since the last four or five years, um, the whole question about what is what is real and what is true has become a totally different meaning again. And this will change as well because there were always manipulations um, when it comes to realities and, 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 and truth. And this is why I think uh, there need, there's no need for, for, for truth. There's only space for fantasy and art. And, and this is how it should be actually, because this is what in a good way distracts you from your normal life as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very true. Um, before we open, before I hand over to, to Claudia, do, Wally, do you have any questions for, for Timo? I mean, I, I, I mean, he, I think I had questions, but I think he answered it quite beautifully. But I just could say that uh, I'm very happy to be here to listen to, to Timo in more detail about his uh, approach to his uh, practice, that I, I saw so many um, common ideas um, how we uh, do art and how the, the, the thing are inspiring especially for him and for me there are some parts which I share with him this kind of pattern and uh, the, the geometry sometimes and, uh, and, and so the element of this uh, culture we, we both somehow relate um, but not directly and not a very kind of we don't want to be uh, labeled as such but we we are inspired by and we are proud to be inspired by that and we try to uh, also employ it or 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 instigate it in a way that is more contemporary and with an a, a universal timeless um, you know you know appeal or uh, form formation yeah so I, I thought to ask him that but anyway he answered me and uh, and uh, because for me, maybe the, the, my my approach is more kind of there's a more political, still political uh, aspect to it. Maybe he try uh, after a while to to remove from that, which uh, I think is very um, uh, uh, interesting and and and, and uh, uh, yeah and understandable that uh, going towards more kind of uh, more uh, open open approach uh, that still maybe there's some trace of politics, but uh, more universality, more timelessness, and uh, yeah. So what I is, mean, what, there's there's yeah. always some some political aspects yeah. about because we are who we are. So yes, absolutely. us speaking as a Iraqi and an Iranian already is a political yeah, thing these yeah, days. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, whether yeah. we want it or not, but yeah. there there is politics in, sure, involved. Sure. So um, yeah, so I'm I'm super happy that we at least met through <laughs> through, yeah, yeah. through this event, and I'm sure yeah. we're going to meet in person soon. I'm sure, really looking sure. forward to it. Sure. Yeah, well, so nice. Claudia, shall, shall I hand to, over to you for, for questions? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all for such a such a wonderful discussion and for sharing your work. Really um, so absorbing to hear you talk through um, talk through your work and these sort of formative in, in, experiences and inspirations. And I was really struck by this discussion or the shared um, kind of thought process around moving from drawing um, into sculpture or into 3D practice as well. Um, but um, yeah, I had several questions, but, um, and, and of course, everyone listening is welcome to uh, ask questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and, and speak directly. Um, but just, yeah, I, I thought maybe starting, um, Waleed, I was really, I loved that phrase that you used of 
uh, drawing as a companion. Um, I think that's correct. Um, and I just wondered if, you know, drawing, I, I think you were talking through how drawing um, is perhaps a way of connecting to the past as well as imagining the future. And I just wondered how drawing, how important drawing was to you in um, discovering the sort of new landscapes or geographies um, of Slovenia and then of London and at, when you first moved into those, into those spaces. Yes, thank you. I mean, um, um, Drawing, you know, I mean, as I said, there's also uh, there's a practical and economical aspect to my mm. practice in drawing because it was the most uh, convenient and um, mean of, of practicing, continue, uh, be able to continue uh, practicing my art. And that became really, as I said, handy and then become even took a form of its own that become an, an art form, independent art form its own without being a painting or sculpture. But then, but uh, it helped me, as you said, it, uh, to outline or to to understand and uh, you know uh, uh, my 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 being, my uh, identity as well, my relation to the place to London, and as well my relation to my previous place, which I'm still, of course, I'm related to it, of course. So how to, to um, uh, resolve this uh, issue? I mean, it's, of course, there's a big issue of identity and where you, where you are and how you experience this thing. Uh, you experience something about something, another place, but you are living in, in a different place, like in London. I feel now, I think these kind of borders are uh, slowly diminishing, really, with, um, you know, things have been so kind of um, intermingled, you know, with, with wars and uh, digital uh, world now and uh, intervention, uh, political intervention, that uh, the world becomes smaller. So I, I don't feel I am so far from where things are happening. Um, so uh, the drawing in, in uh, that sense, it helped me to, to how to formalize my ideas uh, uh, and um, to bring about this kind of relation and uh, uh, as well uh, how to express this, this uh, intricate relation of um, place and, and memory, maybe, or uh, the, the different geographies. So I, I think um, uh, what London gave me is, is uh, maybe the technical or the, uh, we we'll call it the, the compositional or technical uh, uh, aspect of it. How I'm, 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 I would say, inspired by the, the kind of more um, Condense uh, more kind of pared down a composition that helped me to, uh, I would say, to, to, to find my own style. Maybe not, I mean, purely my style, but maybe let's say something to do with me or my uh, experiences or my, 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 yeah, my, my, my research, my, my work. So it's been very helpful, the place here in London. But um, as uh, Timo would say, and as well, but the subject matter or the idea is more to do with some other place. But somehow I feel nowadays they're all connected. We are connected so easily and, uh, you know, differently from before, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, it's in some way connected question, I suppose, for Timo. Um, I was really fascinated by the idea of the, this invented language based on geometry and, you know, and telling stories. Um, uh, using geometry and I, I wondered I think um, well I wondered if we could hear maybe a bit more about um, I think it's your universal alphabet project um, um, I, I was looking at before and I think you also gave us a glimpse of um, what seemed to be a kind of reading uh, of the constellations I suppose um, and all, all the letters in all the stars I wondered if you might just say a few words about about that. Um, I'll try to make that short because I could speak about that for a long um, Yeah, it is another project I did, um, which also was dealing with, um, uh, with letters and alphabets. Um, it is a project that is based on the story of a calligrapher who lived a thousand years ago. And the basic idea of it was that there are missing letters in the Arabic alphabet. Um, still these days, there are letters missing. And I was doing a kind of a research project uh, trying to find these letters that might have been discovered already 1,000 years ago. And I looked for them in the stars, especially I looked for them in the stars in the night sky over Bacta 1,000 years ago, using computer programs to, to recalibrate the, the, the night sky over Bacta, and then looking for constellations um, that could have been uh, the inspiration for the missing letters. 
But then this also, again, is connected to the Borges story I was telling, that, that every constellation could have a meaning um, uh, in the stars. And I started then to, to draw star maps in just like a performative act of, of splashing um, dots on the paper. Um, so creating a star map just by randomly putting, um, putting ink on paper. Uh, but based on the idea that whatever I do on the paper in like putting just points that could be stars, because of the size of our universe, most likely there is a place in this universe where you would look up and you would see what I just splashed on the paper. Um, so it's again a bit this idea of infinity, um, that there is more in the stars than what we see. I mean, we have to remember it's like it's only 400 years that we, are, that we know what's going on up there. It was only um, before 1600, nobody really had a clue what, what's going on and what is the center of the universe and everything. So I'm, I'm always very um, intrigued and, and interested in... in how men are trying to imagine the infinite and finding their own place in it and defining where we are in this vast everything. Um, this is probably where it's coming from. And so, yeah, the stars appear every now and then in my works and then somehow everything is always connected with letters, with alphabets, with, um, different forms of, of writing or, or language. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose that that leads us into or has partly answered um, one of the questions um, that, that we've, we've got from the from the um, audience listening. And um, Fiona Cheney is asking, um, would I be right in saying that drawing is a quest to understanding the world? So big question <laughs> you could think together on perhaps. <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure if I would say yes, um, um, at least not for me, because there's also the other aspect in drawing, and this is the practice of drawing, um, meaning for me, the drawing, the, um, the practice of drawing itself is also something that is in a good way disconnecting me from the world, because it is somehow also a meditational practice. Um, so whether it is these, um, these black drawings of the Mukarnas with the patterns that take weeks and weeks to do, but it's a meditational act of always doing the same four different length sizes of, of lines to, to, um, to, to, do this, to do this work, or it is also this fantasy geometry thing, which I'm not planning. I, I'm trying actually to get into a meditative state, not thinking of something because everything is probably already there. So I will, I start every drawing just with the first element and then just let things happen. So this is actually more a meditative act to disconnect me from the, the now, um, the, the world that I'm living in. And, uh, and this is, so this is, it's more like a, it's probably more a therapy. <laughs> is it for me as well? <laughs> Mm, yes, for you both. I mean, I would agree. It's, um, really, it's, uh, the therapy part is very important for me as well. I mean, especially for me, because I think my work, uh, my drawings all, all over 40 years, is somehow is my visual diary of my, my feelings, my um, so, uh, sense of connection to, to here and back in Iraq and what people went through and what's happening uh, around us and the pandemic now, uh, of course. And so it is kind of more personal thing and not that I would be able to, uh, you know, find the truth or find um, the, the, the essence of life. Rather, it's just an individual to find the result for your issue of you, how you relate to your immediate surrounding and larger world you are as an artist if that contributes to some understanding that's great but i'm not sure how much but we're trying mm. <laughs> yes thank you thank you i wonder um Venetia, you know to bring you in further um you know i was just thinking of course that the title of your your exhibition is reflections contemporary art in the middle east and north africa and but i so there's this this 
big project of reflection but I wondered you know for you personally uh, as a curator who's really built up this collection in a really pioneering way you know I wondered if you could share a little with us about that process of curating the exhibition and looking back on on the collection's formation. Well thank you um well it's been yes it's been an extraordinary journey actually over over many years and I think I think one of the things that started to happen um fairly recently, say the last 10 years or, or, or so, is, is this some um, this notion that that the the art that these wonderful artists make um, is somehow uh, reflecting to bring in the title um, something to do with their with their, with their world. Um, and so to a greater or lesser degree, it can be depending on the artist, but I've been so, so struck um, in terms of the connections to either literary traditions or architectural traditions as we're seeing here, but yet they have these other meanings. So that what I absolutely love about these, these works is that, is that you scratch the surface. You can, you can appreciate them completely from an aesthetic perspective of course, but then you scratch the surface and you, and you understand why, why does, why does Walid always do ziggurats and malwiyas, the spiraling minaret at Samara, but they're becoming gradually more and more abstract. So they're, they're, they're actually then standing for something else as I, as I, as I see them. And, and so in a sense, the, um, this title reflections of, for the exhibition uh, was really tied into that because for me, it's fascinating the way um, artists from this region, whether they still connected to the, the countries of their birth or whether they're in diaspora, they'll speak of history and politics and poetry. And, and that absolutely fascinates me. And so I, I have this kind of other thing about how art can also be a kind of document, if you like, uh, not in a sort of sterile sense of, of just, you know, paper document, but that actually they are markers of time. Um, as well, they speak of their of their times. So, so that's what this reflections kind of is intended to to uh, to imply. Really, is that is that these works are reflective of the preoccupations, um, the knowledge, you know, all of all of that. They 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 touch something. You're seeing the world through the prism of these artists. You're seeing that world. To, to which they are connected through their eyes. And that's something I think that is very exciting and a huge privilege, actually. Wonderful, thank you. Well, we really look forward to the exhibition and we'll all be there as soon as, um, as soon as museums open, hopefully yes. <laughs> May, not before. So that's very exciting um, to look forward to. And, I, we draw to a close now, but there's um, much appreciation um, from our listeners for, you, for your uh, discussion and sharing your work. And it's really been such an expansive uh, discussion and really wonderful um, to, to hear from you and, and to see your sketchbooks and, and process. Um, so thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. We've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank thanks, you very thanks much. Thanks for Thank having us. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Thank great. You. It's been a really nice opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful.